All right, Shalom. It's your brother Kashkwala coming back at you with another quick lesson in the spirit, giving all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shari, by Hashem, Yahweh Double honors to the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone, the ruling teach well. Peace, love, salutation to the elect 144 first fruit. Um, so this may be, a, well, it's going to be a start of a new series. I was thinking about doing, adding it to the Let's Take a Look Into It series, which I got all my playlists, you know, organized on my channel. If you go to the playlist section, but I'm going to start a new series. This is, uh, I think I'm going to title this like the 12, uh, the 12 feathers. And this is going to be the introduction. So pretty much today we're going to go into the third servile war. And we're mainly going to be starting with the three heads, which is the first triumvirate, which of course, one of those individuals in the first triumvirate is in the 12 feathers. So we have to understand what the, the three heads is before we can get to the, the, the 12 feathers. You know, so that's kind of what we're going to go into today, but it's going to be a lot dealing with the third, the third servile war, which technically I should be doing um, a lesson first on the myth, the myth, Dryatic, myth, the Dryatic war, because that came before the servile war, but the spirit has me doing this. So, and then uh, this might be a two part introduction to the 12 feathers. And of course, we you already know what the 12 feather series is going to go into. And uh, when we start with the first feather, it's going to be, of course, Julius Caesar. All right. Just to um, spoil that. So this is uh, second Ezra's 11 and one. It says, then I saw a dream and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had 12, which had 12 feathered wings and three heads. Um, so just to give another spoiler alert, which, you know, brothers should kind of already know anyway, this is like a refresher, uh, the 12 feather wings, um, in order would be, uh, Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitilius, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. So of course the 12 feather wings end with the Flavian dynasty, which consists of Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Okay, but today we're not even going to get fully into the first part of the 12 feathers. We're going to get into the first triumvirate because that's who you have to understand first because they came before the, you know, the 12 feathered wings really became a thing. You got to understand too, um, you can, I can say this. I can say this. If you go into history, you you know, matter of fact, well, I'll just quote it. The scriptures say, uh, the simple, simple believe it in every word, but the prudent man look at well to his going. So you got to have a, like a type of a spirit of like the church of Berea on you to look up all things. They said they were more studious than the Thessalonians. OK, so pretty much what I wanted to say is um, once you get to. Pretty much the three heads started that was part of that Roman Republic. And then when you get to the feathers, really started the empire, starting with Augustus, which was the, the second feather. All right. So let's get into the three, the three heads. So simply second Ezra's 11 and one, just to break it down. Then saw I a dream and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had 12 feathered wings. The 12 feathered rings are the 12 Roman Caesars. All right. The first Caesar starting in the Republic of Rome. And it does. That's why I'm emphasizing it. It does matter. You have to understand the Republic and then the empire. And then this and then the three heads is, again, the Republic of Rome. But the three heads is the first triumvirate consisting of Marcus uh, Craxus. I forgot his middle name. It starts with an L if a brother want to look it up. Marcus Crassus, um, Julius Caesar, and then the third one is Pompey uh, Magnus, all right, or simply known as Pompey, okay? So that's the first triumvirate. Of course, you can get into the second triumvirate, but you would have to start going into the book of Matthew a little prior to the book of Matthew, all right, which consisted of Mark Antony, so on and so forth, which Mark Antony 
is the individual who set up the Herodian dynasty with Herod, the kings of Herod, and, you know, things of that nature. But that's for a different topic in a different time. All right. So let's go ahead and go into the Third Servile War. So, of course, I have a Wikipedia and I'm going to read verbatim here. This started in about 70 BC. It's just going to, we have 73 BC, so lucky. So this is the Third Servile War, also called the Gladiator War in the War of Spartacus. So this should be pretty uh, understanding to bros about, especially, you know, if you didn't know the an AKA nickname for the Servile War was the War of Spartacus. We know about Spartacus. Okay, Spartacus was a jank. Okay, it says was the last of the series of slave rebellions against the Roman Republic. So that that does solidify what I was saying with the 12 feather rings, starting with the Republic and uh, the Republic, the Roman Republic. All right. And of course, the three heads were in the Roman Republic as well. You always start with the Roman Republic. It's just like naming um, uh, the seven heads in Revelation. You always start with the Greeks. It is start with the Greeks and then name them however. But you always start with the Greeks for edification purposes. So in this sense, for edification purposes, you always have to start with the Roman Republic before you get to the empire. There is a spiritual reason why the Lord brought Yahweh Shai or Yahweh brought Yahweh Shai during the time of the empire. All right. Just look up the, the name Republic and then look up the, the word empire and you'll understand why Yahweh Shai came during the empire and not the Republic. Okay. All right. So going on, it says was the last in a series of slave rebellions against the Roman Republic known as the Servile Wars. The third rebellion was the one, the only one that directly threatened the Roman heartland of Italy. It was particularly alarming to Rome because its military seemed powerless to suppress it. The revolt began in 73 BC with the escape of about 70 slave gladiators in gladiator, from a gladiator school in Cap, uh, Capua. Now, what you can do, a good show to watch, is Spartacus, all right? I know a lot of brothers are privy to that show. You need to watch that show, Spartacus. It will give you an understanding of really what was going on, okay? They were really slaves trying to beat it or gladiators trying to fight their way to freedom you could say so in a sense that's another indication you gotta that's jake it was jake trying to fight their way to freedom and they got they got annoyed with slavery and rebelled simple and plain as that you can kind of liken this unto that movie birth of a nation um you know way later on in history with um nat turner OK, it's the same thing. There's a whole bunch of slaves tired of slavery. So they p picked up arms, took over their their uh, their plantation and started going to wreak habit at other plantations. All right. It was a rebellion. It says the the able bodied adults of this large group were surprisingly effective armed force that repeatedly showed that uh, they could withstand and defeat Roman military with the local with the local uh, companion patrols to the Roman uh, militia and even to train uh, even to train Roman legions under counselor uh, command. So I'm just going to stop it right there. And what I'm going to do is go down to the bottom of how it pretty much ended. All right. All right. So the end, the end of the war. So Pompeii. So let me give you just a, a brief overview of the first tri triumvirate. Of course, you have Pompeii uh, Magnus. You had uh, Marcus. You had uh, Marcus Crassus. Okay, matter of fact, let me see if they mention his whole name up here, real quick. Yes, there it goes. I knew it started with an L. Marcus uh, Licinius Crassus. Okay, but you could just call him Crassus, you know. But um, so you had the uh, the the first triumvirate, Pompey Magnus. Marcus Lucinius Crassus, and then of course you had Julius Caesar. Now, to get an understanding of their roles, Pompey was a good general, okay? So was Julius, but he had great ambition for power. That was his, uh, what is it? I guess, um, 
attribute or his adding on to whatever in that group. And then, of course, you had Marcus Crassus, who was the richest man in Rome. So just to paint a small picture, which I may do a lesson on, Julius Caesar was the most ambitious one to get into rulership. And Julius Caesar, at the time before he created, because Julius was the brains of the first triumvirate, before he created the triumvirate, he was doing a pretty much a tour, all right, or he had a mission or he was stationed in Spain. And once he took pretty much took Spain over, he was he wanted to come back to the to Rome to start his political reign. OK, so he had the military background, but now he wanted to start his political reign, which I will stop it right there. I'm going to do a whole I, it's solidified. I'm going to do a whole lesson on Julius Caesar when I when I do the first feather. All right. And of course, Marcus um, Crassus was the richest man in Rome. So he brought the financial finances to the first triumvirate. He actually paid half of Julius Caesar's debt off, which got Julius in a good position in the in the uh, when he was running for office in, in, in Rome. And then, of course, Pompey, who was a great general and he was loved by the people. So therefore, in that group. The people were for them because of Pompey. So they had the popularity and the fame. OK, so it was the ultimate group. All right. And the next thing you need to understand is the word triumvirate. All right. Tri meaning three. All right. So it's triumvirate simply means three individuals who come together and work together in order to establish power to run a government. That's what triumvirate means. OK, so the end of the war of the, the third servile war says the legions of Pompey were returning to Italy, having put down the rebellion of Quintus Sertorius um, in Hispania. Sources disagree on whether Crassus had requested reinforcement or whether the Senate simply took advantage of Pompey's return to Italy by Pompey, but Pompey was ordered to bypass Rome and head south to aid Crassus. Now, the reason I want to read that part is because when you really do an in-depth study, and I'm not about to do an in-depth lesson on the Third Servile War, I'm just bringing out points, all right? When you look into the actual war, Crassus was the main one doing all the battling and winning all the battles. Yes, Pompey did win battles, but Crassus did the majority of the fighting. But Pompey, through this last, you know, kind of push by the Romans, took the glory. It's like you are in a, doing a project with three people in high school or whatever, and you do all the work, but everybody gets an A because of the work you did, and they get just as much credit as you did, but didn't do shit. So that's kind of what was happening here, and Pompey took the, um, the glory for the Servile War and the Mithridatic War as well, okay, um, which made them two hate each other. And you, you, of course, you can see why, you know, because one did all the work, but you're taking the credit for the work. And then also uh, Crassus, he paid for he had bought a large Navy fleet, naval fleet, which actually helped in the aid of winning the Mithridatic War and also the Servile War. But of course, Pompey took the credit for that. But that's when you have Julius come in the, in the scene with his ambition for power. And, and made them two ally with one another. So he was pretty much the mediator between them two to get along. Okay? So that's one thing you have to understand there. So um, going on, it says the Senate also sent reinforcements under the command of uh, Lucullus, mistakenly throughout a, by um, Apian to be uh, Lucius Licinius, a Lucullus commander, uh, of the forces engaged in the third Mithridatic War, which I don't think I'm going to do a lesson on that. Y'all can look that up. But who appears to have been the pro, uh, the pro council of Mes Macedonia, Marcus Tyrintius, uh, uh, Vero Lucullus, the former's younger brother. So with Pompey's legions marching from the north and Lucullus's uh, troops uh, landing in uh, Brond. Uh, Dizium, Crassus realized that if he did not put down the slave revolt quickly, credit 
before the war would go to the general who arrived with reinforcements and he spurred his legions on to the end con uh, in the conflict conflict quickly. So, of course, that's what I was saying earlier. He understood if Pompey's reinforcements come, Pompey's reinforcements would totally decimate um, the, the revolt, which ended up happening in Pompey took the credit for it. So really, this was pre first triumvirate and this the, the Mithridatic War and the Servile Wars were the wars that solidified and started forming the first triumvirate with Crassus, Pompey and uh, Julius Caesar. So I just wanted to come and establish that. Let this be the first establishing lesson to the 12 feather series that I'm going to start up here. It's always good to go back through the breakdowns, and that's what I'm going to do here uh, for anyone who wants to listen. So Lord willing, this was edifying, and it gives you a, the starting ground to understand the 12 Roman Caesars that are going to be mentioned in 2nd Ezra's the 11th chapter, and also give you an understanding of the three heads. So I want to give all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Yahweh double honors to the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone who rule and teach well. Peace of salutation to the elect 144 first group. Brother Kosh Kwal, until the next time, I want to say Shalom. And like always, repent for Yahweh Shai is coming back sooner than what me and you believed. Shalom.